I've completely derailed where my thought process was going there as well. Like I was really, Look, I was really we're, sure we're that out of I had, practice, lads. It's, I was really like sure that months. I had a, I was really sure that I had a point, and then. Hello, welcome back to the Cricket Nerds. It's been a hey. minute, um, <laughs> but after a, a very hectic summer, um, James, Benj, and myself are here to bring you basically. What is the state of Test cricket for England, one day cricket, 2020 cricket? We're just going to talk about England, basically, um, and the summer they've had, what is looking like moving forward, what we're interested to see, and basically just have a chat with you all because it's it has been a while. Um, Benji is now a married man. That's I am a married cool. man, that's true. Um, that's happened. So, yeah, that, that's a bit of an insight into into bit of what's been happening uh, i'm now in uh, you're, australia you're in australia which yeah, again there's another thing yeah um and yeah. james me and james play for the same cricket team now james, james requires leg surgery there james requires leg that. surgery yeah, yeah. And so, isn't gonna play uh, cricket next year yeah my, my update's probably the least interesting of all of them but yeah. there we go but no give yeah. give james some some love in the comments because he can't play cricket once he's had a surgery for a while which is very sad um but he'll remain a uh cricket badger sitting on the sofa um Saying who should so be. You're going to miss the whole of next of, of next summer, James. Or do you reckon you'll be able to be back? Hopefully, in be back around it? July. So Ooh. should should have the next should have a couple of months of, of yeah. cricket. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. no, there were some highlights in our cricket this year. I got my first seven for. Yeah, well, you've five, mentioned five, that already, Bench. I know. Weird. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're what like one minute into a podcast. One minute in. Bench yeah. the James fact got his first got fifty. Good... <laughs> yeah, you got, got well, some good figures. Yeah. James got his first fifty. So yeah. it was good things. Yeah, I mean. I think with with the podcast, with the break we've had, I've kind of had a bit of reflection and um, a lot of our podcasts are quite similar with the match reviews and things. We kind of want to talk about like what what do those games mean? What What is the state of cricket? And we're, we've got a few ideas about some other things that we like to do, like best 11s. Um, so if you've got any ideas of what 11 you want us to see, maybe Brits. I don't know the best Indian team of the 1990s or just something random like that. Let us know what yeah. you want to see and, and we'll do our best to, to bring it as well. So talking about the English summer, uh, England themselves have played five series, um, a couple of 2020 series, a one day series that they're currently in against Australia and they've played the two test match series. What do you want to talk about first? Should we go with test cricket? Cause it's the best form. Test cricket, always test yeah. cricket. So three games against the West Indies first. Three games against Sri Lanka. And the thing I want to start off with is Basball almost got England their first um, complete winning summer since 2004, the first in 20 years. But at the same time, Basball let us down in that last test match against Sri Lanka. Um, so let's talk about that. Should we have won all six test matches this summer? Yeah, just yeah. before we do that, should we still call it Basball or should we just call it England cricket England. <laughs> probably <laughs> because it's been you know they've been in place for two three years now is it still really basketball or is it just playing aggressively like that's an excellent question that's what it is so that's the question I'm, I'm gonna pose <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm up to carry on with basketball it's, it's a good laugh isn't it yeah, yeah um I would say they definitely should have won the the last test match as well it was mostly cockiness and complacency that cost them that being said, Sri Lanka have done really well and they've done well since as well. Um, and they're obviously playing uh, in in Sri Lanka at the moment uh, against yep. New Zealand. Um, but they are... Let's test. They're not a bad side. They are... like They've got some good players in there, particularly Kamindu Mendis seems like an absolute gun. Um, but they, yeah, they've got, they've got plenty of decent players there. And it was, I, I think it was largely just complacency that cost England. Um, they they saw what they thought was a, an opportunity to basically just kill off the game by really going aggressive. Yeah. Um, and Sri Lanka just, they bowled pretty tight and they batted better than England expected. Um, and it was that complacency that cost them. Whereas, yeah, you know, I, I feel like if it was, um, against Australia or India, mm. then England probably wouldn't have batted in the same way. They wouldn't have thought, oh, we can just, 
you know, we can put up a massive total. We can really put the pressure on the bowlers here. They would have maybe gone for a little bit more of a measured approach um, and probably ended up, you know, winning from that position. But, yeah. you know, th- th- there are... There are lots of lessons that could be learned. I mean, I I don't think many. Uh, sorry, I think that a few of the the victories that England had this summer were pretty flawed victories. You know, mm. I think um, they 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 kind of they got a little bit lucky a couple of times. And that's obviously nitpicking. You know, it's great to see England winning, mm. and let's let's never forget the the depths of despair that England came from. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah. I'd yeah. say, like you know, that it's it's not an infallible technique, and I think the the biggest issue with England cricket at the moment, um, as in with within that test side, whatever, is uh, is cockiness, and it, it's yeah. it's probably the most unlikable thing about this England setup is they go from looking like they're having fun to suddenly looking quite arrogant, and that's probably the perspective of a lot of other countries as well. Yeah, I think what one that's kind of been come to light in the recent series against Australia with um, Harry Brook making some comments about, oh, who cares? Like, that's just the way we play. Um, mm. But then you see how Harry Brook then played in the next match and it was night and day, really, in terms of his uh, composure, in terms of how he went about his innings. It was a lot more assured. And this has happened a lot. I mean, you look at England versus West Indies, in those matches, like England, you look at the winning margins, England won by an innings and 114 runs in the first one, by 241 runs in the second one, and then they won by 10 wickets. Um, you have to play well to win by those margins. But there were times where England didn't look great and they were probably too aggressive and they'd defend their approach to the press and to the media. And then the next innings, they'd play a completely different way. And it's like we're kind of missing that consistency from them where they're just playing that sensible but still positive brand of cricket over an extended period of time. But I just hope it comes with time because England have some really talented players uh, that we've seen perform all summer. Um, should we talk about some of those players? Uh, ben, do you want to talk about, I don't know, Jamie Smith maybe? or Well, those? two standout players that have come out from this summer for me, especially in test. I mean, you've got Gus Atkinson and you've got Jamie Smith. I mean, those two have been the the highlights especially with like you know James Anderson moving on and that first test in Lords I mean it feels like about a thousand years ago now but um that first question these test with Anderson sort of sign off oh, yeah, um, true. I mean fantastic wasn't it like that was what what a day and, and, and what a excellent career we've we, we've seen from from him but that changing of the guard you know we all actually saw that this year in Test cricket, with Anderson moving on, we lost Truett Broad last year. No, he's not dead, but he's now commentating <laughs> for Sky Sports. But it has meant that there's been that new blood that are coming through. I mean, yeah, Gus Atkins and Jamie Smith, they have been both fantastic. And I think Jamie Smith has all the makings of a fantastic, maybe not all format player. I don't necessarily see him within the T20 setup, although he can play T20. That's just the modern player now. Um, but definitely within that test and that ODI structure, he could be a massive prospect for the for the future um you know it goes back to all good england players come from surrey which is a bit of a shame mm-hmm. surrey have somehow won the county championship again um so Three their domination row, yeah. continues which is sickening um as a not as not as a non-surrey fan but you know they seem to be doing something right i mean gus atkinson wasn't he just for, phenomenal like the amount of wickets that he took over this summer um, opening the bowling for England when he doesn't really open the bowling for Surrey very much. Um, the sheer amount of wickets that he took and then also that 100 at Lords. I mean, what a first test summer to have. And, you know, we've seen him playing white ball too. He's not been a slouch in the ODI um, setup when he's been in there. I think for me, it's been exciting to see this new blood. Um, but how do we keep them safe? You know, Gus Atkinson has pulled out of the ODI series with an, an, an injury. Josh Hull pulled out of the ODI series with an injury. Are we going to break our players already? Because I don't know what you two thought, but it sounds like we had a quite a good test summer. We had a good group of players to pull from, but whether it was our 100% fittest group of players, you know, Mark Wood, we lost him halfway through the, the series to, to injury. Yeah. That seems to me is is one of the biggest problems. Yeah, there's all this great talent coming through, but if we break them, 
I mean, what's the point? I mean, look at Joffre Arch now, James. You know, you've got a lot of things to say about Joffre Arch, which we'll come on to probably more when we talk about the white ball side of things. But yeah, it's great to see these, these new players through. But how do we nurture them? How do we we look look after them? Um, I don't know. I think I think they have to bowl more. <laughs> mm. it's, it seems weird, but um, I think all this resting and rotation and stuff actually can work to a player's detriment. You know, if you've ever been injured. Um, or you, know, you you look at you look at when like fifty year old blokes have a foot race, and there's zero like zero warm up, and like they'll just instantly pull a hamstring. That's what I think is like a slightly more extreme version of what happens with with fast bowlers. You know they're they're rested and they're you know, they, they have so much time between each lot of bowling, um, so much of the time that. I think that's part of why they keep on getting so injured. Um, I, obviously, that's from a non-physio point of view, from a very, very, you know, kind of, well, amateur point of view, to be honest. But um, I, I, I just think that we need to get people bowling more. Um, maybe not in the massive spells that like Joffre did under Joe Stokes. Root in that 2019 Ashes and, and, yeah. and Ben Stokes, where they are going to break themselves if they're doing, you know, 10 overs at a time of bounces at 90 miles an hour. That's not yeah. healthy. Um, but there have been plenty of fast bowlers in the past that were nowhere near as injury prone. And they were playing, you know, county games and then they were going straight into internationals. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it says a lot. But one thing I thought was really interesting is um, the way that England have selected this year. Because you were right, like some some of the no, the new players have been absolutely brilliant. Jamie Smith, I think I think he will be an all format player. I, I could see him doing very well in T twenties. Um, Gus Atkinson, another one. Um, Shah Bashir has been absolutely brilliant again. Yeah. You know they've re- kept the faith in him. Josh Hull was the most bizarre pick of all time. I think he averaged about. Is it one hundred and something this season yeah. in the, in the County yeah. Championship, like sixty yards in uh in first class with going into that England game. And have so my question for you, um have England found a way of selecting have they just proved that selection for um for international games should be on attributes and not necessarily wholly on performance? Because you know what what works in the county championship might not necessarily work in international. If I can throw a couple of examples out, um, we've got Matt Parkinson, who mm-hmm. for a few seasons was the best spinner in England. Um, you know, he was certainly around there with, yeah. it was like Liam Dawson, Jack Leach, um, Simon Harmer, obviously wasn't English, and then Matt Parkinson. And you know, he had a ridiculously low average. He was going for no runs, but he was a very slow leg spinner. And as soon as he got called up to the international stage, I think it was against New Zealand, he yeah. started getting tonked around. Um, is is it a question of what works at kind of, you know, that, that county level maybe doesn't work in international? Maybe. I mean, I think one thing that England have done very well with selection is they've been brave. I mean, they've... And in being brave, they've also backed their players. So you mentioned Shah Bashir. There's an argument that he's not the best spinner in England. Um, however, he has those attributes which you think, oh, he'd do well in Australia. Mm. So we're going to use him all summer um, rather than picking maybe someone who's going to hold a, a line of length and go at three runs and over maximum and maybe not take all the wickets. But they've they've tossed the dice, they've gone with Sherbyshire. And I think it's it's the right call because he does have those attributes. And you talked about overs getting overs in your legs. Sherbyshire needs that because the more experience he gets between now and Australia, then those attributes are going to be useful. Someone like Josh Hull, it's the same thing. Blood him early, but he's tall, he can bowl quickly. We might not have seen it at his best against Sri Lanka, but he's got more to offer. Um and so I I think those calls are needed um, and it takes someone like Brendan McCullum and Ben Stokes to make those calls and ensure that these players are 
um, being blooded early and, and having the experience so they can yeah. succeed in places like Australia. I think what we find with, especially with the step up from the county game. So we're talking about the county championship. So the domestic first class list, a uh, domestic first class two test matches. Uh, and we, 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 we've talked about it previously, but what works in England on a rainy day in April? I mean, if, if you look at when the bulk of the county championship calendar is, you've got April, you've got games that are on now at the end of September. Yeah. Actually, during the middle of the season, during the middle of August, there was no counter championship because it was the hundred. Um, there was the blast, all of the white ball stuff going through. Because fair enough, that's where the money is. But <laughs> is that actually having a detriment on our test team potentially? Because you know, a seventy-five mile an hour bowler that nips it off a length. I mean, Jamie, Jamie Porter, he took fifty-five wickets. But he would never play for England. No, I want to say it right now. He's thirty-three. <laughs> He'll never play for England. But he has taken the most wickets in the county championship this year because what works in the county championship on a grass wicket that nips around in April with a Dukes ball doesn't necessarily work in Australia at the Gabba with a Cookaburra ball because if you bowl at 75 miles an hour on a good length, I'm sorry, but you're going to go the distance yeah. when you've got Steve Smith and Marnus Labuschagne yeah. standing at the other end. But it's the same for so, batting as well. I mean... Someone like David Bedding- Beddingham, for example, he's qualified to play for South runs. Africa, but he's consistently one of the top run scorers in the county championship, top average every single season for like the last five seasons. And he goes and plays test match cricket for South Africa and he looks completely out of his depth. But he obviously succeeds in those months that the county championship play- is played and does incredibly well. So it's the same for batsmen and bowlers. And yeah, you've kind of got to look at the attributes that work uh, and as, I, as I've said, you've got to be brave um, and think about what's going to work all over the world. Um, someone like Chris Wokes says he's he's happy just playing in England, but he's happy to consider playing elsewhere. For me, he's he was England's best bowler all summer. And he's also the one who's come to the end of it, not injured, um, whereas I feel like everyone else has. Um, for me, he's been England's standout bowler um, of the summer. Um what about you guys? Who else would you say has been standout players for you for England this Test match summer? Joe Root's always in there. Um, his yeah. consistency is remarkable, um, mm. especially against Sri Lanka. For some reason, he just really likes playing against Sri Lanka. He's got an in- insanely good record against them. Yeah, um, but yeah, he he was he really impressed me. Um, I think, yeah, I I don't see Darren Lawrence getting another go for a little while especially opening he's kind of done the opposite I, I feel bad for him to be honest because he's he's been on the fringes for so long and then he finally gets a shot but they make him open like i yeah. i wouldn't I, I would have had him as a spinner um you know sort of in you know when it was uh the pakistan tour and they played liam livingston at number eight and as a as a as a bowler he inevitably got injured during that game and didn't bowl um but that's the kind of role that I would have put Dan Lawrence in as like, you know, the way you'd play like a Glenn Maxwell in tests. Yeah. Somebody that could be a really explosive, but is a technically good batsman in a sort of eight, nine and, but has come along with his spin. Cause for Surrey, he's been a really good spin bowling all rounder. Yeah. So yeah. that's, um, I realized I, I got think... completely off piece there. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was meant to be talking about players that have impressed me. I was instantly go to the one that's probably going to get dropped. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, other than that, you know, it's the the usual suspects of well, not the usual ones, but the the new suspects: <clears throat> Jamie Smith, class; Gus Atkinson, class. Um, I was yeah, incredibly impressed by Shah Bashir as well. Um, somebody that probably didn't fulfill as much potential as they have this test summer was Harry Brook. That is a little bit of a shame because he, you know how good he is, but with a tour to Pakistan, he'll probably get his average back up to around 60. So although not, there is talk that they worry. might they might not be able to play in Pakistan. They might move it to UAE. Um oh, really? which could be England interesting because England really struggle there. I don't think they've yeah. won a test match there. And there's some uh, more security issues have on there, I think. Yeah. Um but we'll um, see. Shame. 
I mean, I hope they'll play in Pakistan because it's 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 a good thing for cricket to have cricket in Pakistan. You know, when we played there a few years ago and we had, you know, that famous Raul Pindi test, the start of Basball, where I think 500 and something runs were scored on the first day. Yeah. Um, you want to see that type of thing. Again, that was actually quite, even though it was, you know, quite um, flat wickets, it was so entertaining. And I think England coming away with that series win was awesome there. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I do hope they do play in Pakistan. Um, obviously, I think, you know, Mark Wood in the first, um, in the West Indies series was phenomenal. Um, I mean, he was bowling with pace, absolute rockets, like 97 miles an hour, um, trying to clock that Sean Tate 100 miles an hour, which I'm sure that he'll do as long as we wrap him in bubble wrap and give him four over spells for the rest of his life. Yeah. Question then. Um, based on how good Wood was and the fact that Joffre Archer has been coming back, do we see Joffre Archer playing test matches again? Because at the moment, you know, they're not even playing him in two ODIs that are close together. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, um, I'm going to go on this because judging by what we've seen him as an ODI bowler, probably not. I, I just think Joffre Archer, the bowler that we've seen in this series against Australia, isn't the Joffre Archer. He played in the 2019 World Cup. Isn't the Jaffa Archer played in the 2019 Ashes? And it's a sad thing to see because he was so good and so exciting when he came into that team. And having, I mean, he's had three years off pretty much. Like if you have three years off your job, you're going to be rusty. Um, I don't think he can get back into the test team. Definitely not this year. Maybe next year in time for an away Ashes, if he stays fit. You know, maybe he playing through next test summer, get him ready for Australia, but without breaking him. Um, because I think if we have a any chance, because everything should culminate around the ashes, let's be honest. Mm. <laughs> if we have any chance of not getting slaughtered in Australia next year, we need to have a pace attack that are mm. quick yeah. and can actually bowl fast and not just get smashed to all cup corners by Monas Labashane and Steve Smith. I mean, I mean, there's one, the one thing with Joffrey Archer that he brings, I know he's not really impressed as in the recent 2020 one day series, but he's kind of just getting back into things. But when he first came on the scene in playing for England in one day cricket and in the ashes, he had that ability kind of like Stuart Broad, kind of like James Anderson, maybe five, 10 years ago, where he can have a spell where he just picks up regular wickets and you feel like every single ball he can take a wicket. And with Mark Wood, Mark Wood has those spells every now and then, but not quite at the same frequency that maybe someone like Stuart Broad or James Anderson would have. And England are looking for those players who are going to replace them and do as well as them. And so someone like Joffrey Archer has that ability. Um, and that's why it'll be exciting to see him back in Test cricket. But whether he has the ability to do that for a number of Test matches, like you could see Stuart Broad and James Anderson, they would play every single Test in a summer. Joffrey Archer, I don't see that happening. Um, so mm. maybe we should be looking at other players. Maybe Gus Atkinson, who we saw in that first test match, he was able to obliterate the West Indies batting lineup, which albeit might not be that difficult um, comparing with, say, an Australian batting lineup. But it's looking at these options and, and thinking who else can can potentially do that. Um, the, on, on that, you, yeah. you do raise a really interesting point with you know Mark Wood, Joffrey Archer, um, you know, there's a stereotype of uh, like fast bowlers are dumb. Mm. Um, I, it's mostly a stereotype that's held by batsmen, I think. But yeah. there, it is a stereotype. Um, I would have to say that there are some players that you can identify that just don't have a, as high a cricketing IQ as others. So let's say Jimmy Anderson, if if we if he's going to be at the top end of English players that have good cricketing IQ um, yeah. and you got, you know, people like Stuart Broad. And then if we're going further afield, we're looking at people like Pat Cummins, yeah. uh, Nathan Lyon, yes. Jasper Bumra. I'd, I'd yeah. say he's, he's up there. Yeah. 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 Ashwin. Ashwin. Yeah. He's, he is, he is top of the pile, right? Yeah. And they're players that when they're put under pressure, they can adapt and they can change what they're doing. They will identify where the scoring options are and they will take those away and they generally will be able to then come back and not be hit out of an attack in any given situation. 
Now, obviously, it, that can change sometimes. You know, T20, you don't really have that much of a chance to. But ODI and test matches, you definitely do. Yeah. Mark Wood, and in this later series with uh, Joffre Archer, seeing him back a little bit more, I just don't think they have the cricketing IQ as much where if they get put under quite a bit of pressure, you can see them just going for runs and they can get hit out of atta- out an attack. And but when they're on it and they're you know they're they're potent, then they are brilliant. And Mark Wood is a perfect example of that. He you know when he's on song and he's you know when you when you can tell he feels like he's fast and he's got the batsman hopping around, he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, Joffre Archer, I think throughout the sort of the start of his career, because he was just lightning quick, but he would sort of just saunter up to the crease and he had this beautiful fluid action and he still does. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of batsmen wouldn't be expecting it and he was just naturally hitting these incredible lengths and he could bowl the Yorker at will. Yeah. Um, and he almost didn't have to think too much about it. It's like being a captain when you've got Bummer in the team. It's like, yeah. You don't have to be a good captain yeah. when you've just got a cheat code there. They'd be like, oh, we need a wicket. Just give the ball. Jasper, yeah. here you go, mate. Yeah, yeah. And that's what that's what I think Archer was a little bit like. And now that he is a little bit more rusty, mm. I think it'll just take him a little bit of time to maybe get a bit of that, that IQ back, which is all about playing more. It's about yeah. getting that experience. I don't think we will never see him play a test match again. I think we'll see him play test matches. And I think he could do really well. And in the same way that Mark would, you know, if if Joffre Archer got off to a decent start in his spell Mm. and he found a a nice rhythm and he found a good area that was causing the batters trouble, he could end up taking fifers and be absolutely brilliant. But I think it's just about adapting when you get put under that pressure. And I don't think he necessarily has that just just now. Um, And there are a few players, I think, that that are the same situation, but and they, they are incredibly talented players. Mm. Um, it's just about having that IQ. I think that's why I, I kind of want to see Chris Wokes go, um, go with the England team because he has that experience, um, and and that's what England are kind of missing without the likes of Broad and Anderson in yeah. the squad. Uh, I guess Anderson's there with them. He's now the bowling console, isn't he? So yeah, yeah. That yeah. that always be that always helps. I, I think with with with, with Wokes, even if he's not selected to open the bowling, like having him there as a twelfth man. I think that could be in, invaluable. Obviously, I love Chris Wokes. I'd love to see him play because he offers that lower order. He has that additional... He's very skillful. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Right. There's two more things that I, I want to briefly talk about and they're to do with the leadership. Um, and it kind of links in with the white ball stuff as well. Well, Oli Pope, was he a good captain? Or do you reckon he was just trying to... He wasn't very good at reviews. Ben Stokes. <laughs> But yeah, Oli Pope had, had a shambolic record with reviews, um, but that's only obviously one part of captaincy. I think with Harry Brook and with Oli Pope, it's really hard when you're not the captain, when you're just filling in for a day. Mm. I think that's that's really difficult because there's a whole, there's a team that's been set up with this certain dynamic and it's been constructed by the captain and the coach working together over a period of time. And it's all pointing towards this one direction. And then you come in as captain and you are either you go along with that same thing and you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to be the fill in guy. I'll tell you where to stand, but I'm putting my head in the, you know, in, in the, I'm putting myself in the mindset of Ben Stokes or Joss Butler, or you have a different mindset, which you're trying to like get everybody to buy into for the three games that you're captain for. Mm. So it's really not easy. Um, I'd say they've done about as well as they could. At Harry Brook, I was not impressed with his. Oh, I don't care. Yeah, um, I, I understand that what 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 mentally what like kind of mentality he's going for. I'm going to back my players. They can do what they want. I trust them. That kind of thing. Mm. But just choose your words better, man. I'd have thought yeah. he'd have learned by the. But from the IPL, when he told like, yeah. a load of Indians to shut up, <laughs> he was. Uh, I thought I would have thought he he got his head around the fact that when you're yeah. talking to the press, it does actually matter what, what you say. say. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. What, what I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I mean, I think that Pope 
it, as you've said, it's really difficult when you're just filling in. I mean, Stokes had that um, a few years ago when Joe Root missed a test match. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's hard for them to fill in. Um, and England, in terms of Harry Brook in the one day setup, England are kind of in that interim stage. They're appointed Brendan McCullum as their head coach, which is massive news. I mean, it will be interesting to see um, how that unfolds because England, when Brendan McCullum became test match coach, it was, he's just doing that. And England are going to have two separate coaches. That experiment kind of failed. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, I think adding Baz into the wide ball setup, you know, it's been something that England have been wanting for a while. I think ever since the Morgan Silverwood days, we've not really been there on the wide ball side of things. Um, and yeah, he's been fantastic in Red Bull, hasn't he? You, he's revolutionised the leadership, revolutionised how that team works. So I think it's quite exciting to see how Brendan McCullum is going to come into that wide ball side, especially seeing how he works with Joss Butler. Um Really exciting. And, and and having one coach across both of them, I think it's going to make the England cricket team feel like one team rather than we have a white ball team and a red ball team, which I think it's felt like for the last few years. I think having one England team, you know, you, you look at Australia, the amount of multi-format players that they have. We've not had that in England recently. And I think that's something that's really going to benefit the game and benefit English cricket as a whole. And having that, you know... Um, What's the word that, that I'm looking for? Consistency. Cohesiveness. Uh, Cohesiveness, oh, consistency. <laughs> but it's just like a business workshop. But Should that's going to be fantastic for the for them, I think. Right. Well, awesome. I think we're about done there. Um, thank you so much for watching. A massive thank you to the members as well that have stuck by this period of absence. Um, yeah, just a, a massive thank you to everybody that's watched this video Obviously, we did just go completely, you know, radio silent for like two months. Um, but yeah, we are back. We are going to do a few more um, videos, a bit like this, you know, talk about the state of the game. Um, let us know what country you want us to talk about as well. Because obviously we've talked about England in this one. If there is a particular country that you're like, oh, can you just talk about the state of Bangladesh and cricket? cricket? Yeah. yeah then we'll we'll do our best to to research it and have, have a chat about it because um yeah we just we, we love cricket we just we were a bit busy for for a little while but yeah thank you so much for watching don't forget to like and subscribe you can follow our social medias um it's all down in the link tree below and we'll see you next time goodbye